Before we get into today's episode, I just wanna let you guys know that I am doing my limited run Pyramid Plushie with Makeship. It is, like I said, limited run, so it's only here for a few weeks. You can pre-order it now at makeship.com. Go to campaigns, look for active campaigns, it's me. Link is also in the description. So quick, easy access. This year's Pyramid Plushie has got cute little purple sweater, big pyramid head, beautiful eye, and this year we've got a 3D teacup. Now, you guys know the deal. Once the pre-order ends, that's it. These are never going to be sold again. So make sure to get one while you can. Again, link is in the description box or just go to makeship.com and go to active campaigns to find my plushie. Jesse Smollett paid two men to attack him and place a homemade noose around his neck. It's a story that sounds stranger than fiction. Unfortunately, racial hoaxes have a lengthy and disturbing history in the United States that have often led to all too real and tragic consequences. Some of them have brought about massacres, others have been perpetrated by murderers attempting to cover their tracks, and one racial hoax was committed by a man that saw it as the only way to get a day off of work. Today, we're going to take a look at some of the most infamous racial hoaxes in US history, their cause as well as their fallout. Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be talking about racial hoaxes. Although the Jesse Smollett case inspired this episode, there are some more graphic racial hoaxes that we'll be discussing. Therefore, if you are not in the headspace to hear about topics of hate crimes, sexual assault, and murders, I recommend skipping this episode. With that being said, let's get into it. Racial hoaxes are, as defined by encyclopedia.com, an instance when someone falsely places blame for a real or fabricated crime on another person because of that person's race. Although a person of any race can perpetrate a racial hoax against a person of another race, the most common racial hoaxes have historically involved white people falsely accusing black people of criminal activity. We can't possibly go back in time to the very first racial hoax. That would be like trying to identify one of the first instances of racism. However, we can take a look at one of the most infamous and well-known cases, which took place in Rosewood, Florida in 1923. At that time, Rosewood had a population of about 200 people. And aside from one white family that just ran the general store, every other citizen was black. On January 1st in nearby Sumner, Florida, a 22 year old named Fanny Taylor was found covered in bruises, screaming and claiming a black man had assaulted her. She told the sheriff, Robert Walker, that she had not been sexually assaulted though. Fanny's husband, James, took matters into his own hands and gathered a mob of white citizens and Klan members to find the culprit. When they learned a black prisoner, Jesse Hunter, had escaped a chain gang, he was immediately deemed the prime suspect. Rather than find and question Jesse, the mob became convinced that the black community was hiding Jesse. They went to Rosewood and found the Carrier family. Aaron Carrier was the nephew of Sarah Carrier who did the laundry for the Taylors. The mob tied Aaron to a car and dragged him to Sumner where he was beaten before Sheriff Walker placed him under protective custody. Blacksmith Sam Carter was also tortured until he admitted to hiding Jesse, but when Carter failed to lead the mob to him, they shot him and hung his body from a tree, lynching him. However, the brutality was far from over. Aaron Carrier's cousin, Sylvester, became the next man who was suspected of hiding Jesse Hunter. Three days after Fanny had reported her assault, 23 white men went to Sylvester's home, shot the family dog, Sylvester's mother, Sarah, and after Sylvester killed two and wounded four of the mob members in self-defense, they killed him too. The children and other survivors fled the home, hiding in woods or swamps to avoid the violence. Sylvester's brother James was discovered a short time afterwards and forced to dig his own grave before he too was killed. The white family that ran the general store at the time helped hide some of the Rosewood residents, but when the carnage ended, Rosewood was virtually abandoned. No one was charged with any of the murders due to, quote, insufficient evidence, according to reports that came out about a month after the Rosewood massacre ended. Official estimates claim six black people and two white people were killed. Catherine Russell Brown, a social scientist and author of the book, The Color of Crime, says that Fanny did claim that she had been sexually assaulted, but that claim was demonstrably untrue. According to the Equal Justice Initiative, survivors later stated that Fanny lied to conceal her extramarital affair with a white man. And as a brief aside, The Color of Crime is also the name of a pamphlet once distributed by the KKK in the 90s, though this is obviously not the source I'm referring to today. 
Catherine also writes that unofficial estimates claim somewhere between 40 to 150 black people were killed in the Rosewood massacre, a far cry from six. And here's the thing here, even if Fanny had been telling the truth, this response was disturbing and disgusting. Whether or not a black man had attacked Fanny, that would not justify attacking and murdering nearly an entire black community. However, when the accusers in these racial hoaxes didn't openly admit to having lied, that isn't necessarily enough to prevent a great miscarriage of justice either. In 1931, a fight broke out on a Southern Railroad freight train in Jackson County, Alabama. According to the Smithsonian, it began when a young white man stepped on a young black boy's hands. The white men were forced to exit the train and quickly developed a story blaming the black boys on the train for the fight. Victoria Price and Ruby Bates, two white women who were dressed in men's clothing were on the train during the incident. When the train stopped in Point Rock, a crowd was waiting for the black boys after hearing the story from the men who had been forced to exit the train earlier. Ruby and Victoria, who faced charges for vagrancy and illegal sexual activity because of their activities on the train, claimed that the boys had raped them and the boys were arrested. The nine young men accused varied in ages from only 13 to 19 years old, and the case was originally tried in Scottsboro, Alabama. Eight of the nine were sentenced to death by an all white and all male jury, while 13 year old Leroy Wright's case resulted in a mistrial after one juror favored life in prison instead of death. I won't get into the details and specifics of the case as we would be here for quite a long time, but Bates eventually recanted her story and appeared as a witness for the defense. Yet even after she admitted that the Scottsboro boys were innocent, they still were kept in prison and sentenced to decade long sentences. Though it's easy to assume that things got better as the civil rights movement progressed and these horrific accusations had died down, that's not really the case. In fact, the book, The Color of Crime features 67 racial hoaxes perpetrated between 1987 and 1996 alone, which is estimated to be only a fraction of all cases. But before we touch upon these examples, let's briefly discuss why they occur in the first place. White law enforcement officials have historically perpetuated racial hoaxes. The word of a white person has been seen as far more valuable and trustworthy than that of a black person. And white initiated hoaxes are often only classified as hoaxes when the offender confesses later on. Racial hoaxes perpetrated by black people are far quicker to be called out or suspected of being fake. Anti-black stereotypes have certainly played a role in this as well as the way that black men are portrayed in the media. Even in an age without minstrel shows, television in the 90s would often characterize and stereotype black people. The Color of Crime explains that daytime talk shows featured black guests that spoke with loud, profane language while discussing their history of committing crimes and or sex life. Black people were shown as quote, amoral buffoons, sassy single mothers, arrogant absent fathers, and unfaithful friends, end quote. Black men have also been harassed by the police and treated like criminals throughout history without reason. The data proves this, and I'm sure many of you listening are more aware of the systemic racism within the United States. So what does this have to do with a racial hoax specifically? It's simple. White people are aware of the history of societal and policial prejudice against black people. Therefore, for those who want to commit crimes, blaming a black man seems like a viable option. They're viewed as a scapegoat. White criminals, such as Bostonian man, Charles Stewart, have used these prejudices to their advantage to shift suspicion off of themselves. In 1989, Charles Stewart murdered his pregnant wife and shot himself in the stomach, along with the help of his brother and friend. Then he called the police and claimed a black man in a jogging suit had committed the crime. Officers stopped, harassed, and interrogated dozens of innocent black men, almost arresting one man, William Bennett, that Stewart identified in a lineup. It wasn't until months of searches and a tip from Stewart's brother that police began to consider Stewart as a suspect. Stewart took his own life before he could face charges. Little bitch. This alone would be alarming enough, but the story actually gets worse. Allegations surfaced that Boston's police had actually threatened witnesses to make a case against William Bennett. Now, this was in 1989, Boston. It was in an area of the United States that many of us don't really consider super racist, but as illustrated in the article, it has an incredibly racist history. It's important to recognize this didn't just happen in some small little, you know, seemingly sundown town in the South somewhere, but it does happen everywhere. Also, there's a little doubt in my mind that had these witnesses testified against Bennett and had Stewart's brother not actually given that tip, Bennett would have actually gone to prison for nothing. And on the note of people paying for their crimes, uh, a black man jogging shouldn't be seen as a threat. And as you guys know, with the Ahmaud Arbery case, this is something that's still a recent problem. 
The three men involved in that were actually charged for this guy's murder, but this is something that literally happened, what, two years ago? Black men jogging should not be seen as a threat. This is ridiculous that this still happens, but I digress. Other equally upsetting and disturbing racial hoaxes have taken place around this time frame. In October, 1994, for example, Susan Smith, a white woman from South Carolina, told police she'd been carjacked by a 20 to 30 year old black male. The man drove off with her sons in the car. One was 14 months and the other was three years old. The police drew a sketch of the black man based on her description and circulated it far and wide, only for Susan to confess to murdering her sons nine days later. Some racial hoaxes aren't even meant to cover up a crime, but sound like attention seeking stories. One white woman in 1994 lied about being approached by a black man with a gun who, quote, put a gun to my child's head while he laughed, end quote. In 1995, a white man told police that a black man with light colored hair braids, a deformed pupil in one eye, acne scars on his cheek and missing front teeth robbed him. The color of crime reads, In a hoax that defies classification, a white Louisiana woman told police she had been sexually assaulted by a black man. She said her attacker had a tattoo of a serpent on his arm. A police sketch of the rapist was widely circulated in Baton Rouge. In a bizarre twist, 28 other women notified police that they too had been assaulted by the imaginary serpent man. The high number of copycat victims appears to reflect more than the usual hysteria associated with criminals on the loose. Within days, the alleged victim confessed she had made up the rape story. The fact that so many white on black hoaxes are successful indicates society's readiness to accept the image of black people as criminal. Of course, this isn't to say that we shouldn't believe rape victims and support them, but any criminal, any case needs evidence. And the fact that racial hoaxes have not only been believed, but acted upon and tried without evidence, such as the Scottsboro boys is insanely distressing, but somehow it gets worse. Not only are racial hoaxes done to shift blame or for attention, but for the most insignificant reasons too. In 1996, Dennis Pittman, a white man, reported that he had been carjacked by a black man and forced at knife point to drive his kidnapper from Philadelphia to Atlantic City. After being questioned, Pittman admitted he made it up to avoid future car payments. A few years earlier, Miriam Kashani also staged a rape hoax that according to her has been meant to highlight the problem of safety for women and was never meant to hurt anyone or racially offend anyone. I fail to see how a false rape claim helps anyone. People are already afraid to report their cases for the stigma of not being believed. False reports make things that much harder for victims of sexual assault to come forward. In 1995, one white New Jersey man was so desperate for a day off work that he claimed to have spotted a black man running in a wooded area carrying a small white child. An extensive air and land search were conducted before the man admitted he'd made the entire thing up. Now, some of these cases sound too ridiculous to be believed. And as was the case with Susan Smith, black people did not believe her story. According to the color of crime, many black people questioned where a young black man could possibly go with two small white children without raising suspicion. After all, as we just saw, even someone claiming to see a black man run off with a white child wanted an immediate air and land search at the time. Yet white people believe Susan Smith again, underscoring how willing society is to accept the criminal black man stereotype. Not only do these hoaxes continue to fuel these negative stereotypes, but they can introduce racist ideals to children too. In 1990, a white woman in upstate New York by the name of Lucille Magrone sent various letters to white people within the neighborhood. They were supposedly, air quotes here, supposedly written by a black man, threatening them with rape and murder if they didn't move away. Even though the letters were revealed to be written by Magrone herself, the damage had still been done. One of her white neighbors later said, small children in the neighborhood have been introduced to racism that was never there before. Now it is in their minds that black people are bad, that black people are trying to break in, that there's a boogeyman, a black boogeyman out there who's going to get them. Children as young as seven have fabricated assault charges against black men. So how do we unteach this? How do we get it to stop? While charging Susan Smith for the racial hoax she committed might seem unnecessary considering she was already being charged with the murder of her two children, the lack of punishment for these racial hoaxes is also a problem. In 1995, New Jersey drafted legislation known as false reports to law enforcement authorities, specifically designed to tackle racial hoaxes and punish people for filing fictitious reports. The reason why someone accuses another or how racist they may be doesn't matter. As long as there's racial finger pointing involved, it would break the law. More frequently in recent years, we've seen hoaxers have to pay fines for wasting law enforcement's time and even serve time behind bars. However, this isn't the kind of racial hoax Jesse Smollett committed. Smollett claimed he was the victim of a crime that never took place. This kind of racial hoax has its own history too. 
And before we dig into that history, we're gonna take a quick moment for today's sponsors. The winter season is amazing. It's one of my favorite times of the holidays because I love winter fashion. As you guys know, sweaters, love it. Boots, love it. Long pants, jackets, scarves, love it. But what I don't love is having to actually go out and shop. I don't wanna be out there. I don't wanna be anywhere near it. So I'm really grateful for Stitch Fix Freestyle that delivers custom curated pieces directly to my phone so I can take a look at what I might like and quickly buy it and have it delivered to me. They've got styles for every occasion, whether it's work, lounging at home, or hitting the town. And it's really great because you just take their style quizzes and then it helps them figure out what you might like or might not like. So the more you use it, the better it gets to know you. Plus they've got free shipping, returns and exchanges and you don't need a subscription, just use it when you need it. So if you wanna get started today, go ahead and start by filling out their style quiz at stitchfix.com slash casket. That's stitchfix.com slash casket to try Stitch Fix Freestyle. Stitchfix.com slash casket. Now, We are on Christmas Eve right now, but that doesn't mean you can't look out for your future self and keep getting some amazing holiday deals because gifting yourself is important too. So if you're looking for a new wireless plan, it's also the season of switching phone carriers. And that's also because Mint Mobile is offering one heck of a deal right now. For a limited time, when you buy any three month wireless plan, you'll get an extra three months for free. And it's absolutely wild considering they offer premium wireless service with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data on the nation's largest 5G network starting at just $15 a month. Mint Mobile lets you choose the amount of data that's right for you, so you can stop paying for data that you just don't use. And I've used them for over a year, and I can personally attest that my phone bill is, it's insanely cheaper. Like I'm saving something like 70, 80 bucks a month, like it's bonkers. So for a limited time, buy any three month Mint Mobile plan and get three more months for free by going to mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. And you guys already know the winter season, it's here, it is upon us kind of. Colorado's not really as cold as it usually is, but that doesn't stop me from wanting to feel frosty, cooled, and winterized. And that's why I use HelloFresh to help me deliver fresh meals every single week to my door. And this year, and seasonally obviously, they do a holiday twist. So I've been all over it. They've got some comfy, cozy food like chicken sauce, sausage and sweet potato soup for cold nights. And they've got entertaining options too, like holiday cheese and charcuterie boards and skinny dip dark chocolate peppermint almonds. It doesn't matter what you're in the mood for. HelloFresh has you covered with over 50 different menu options available every single week. From gourmet options, vegetarian, low-cal, whatever you're looking for, they have you covered. And don't forget dessert. You can satisfy your sweet tooth with seasonal limited time goodies like ginger spice cake truffles and cherry cheesecake swirl bars, which sound incredible. So go to hellofresh.com slash casket14 and use code casket14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. That's up to 14 free meals and three free gifts at hellofresh.com slash casket14 and use code casket14. The term white on black hoaxes refer to the cases we've discussed in detail thus far. When a white person or a group of white people accuses a black person or a group of black people of a crime they didn't commit. Black on white hoaxes are also true in reverse, but they tend to have different motivations behind them. As Catherine Russell Brown writes, White on black hoaxes are typically created as random acts of black violence. This reflects the public belief that black people run amok committing depraved, unprovoked acts of violence against white people. While the only white people who commit violent crimes against black people are racial extremists. Like the white on black hoaxes, the motivations for black on white hoaxes are varied. Some black on white hoaxes are perpetuated as insurance scams. Others are created to shift criminal responsibility. Still others are fabricated to evoke sympathy. It appears that black people perpetuate hoaxes for many of the same reasons that white people do, out of self-interest. The majority of black on white hoaxes may have been created as hate crimes simply because hate crime is one of the few crimes that society can see a white person committing against a black person. Historically, when white people have committed racial hoaxes, we've seen it lead to tragedy and hate crimes. The vast majority of the time when black people have committed racial hoaxes, it is to falsify hate crimes. As I said earlier, when a woman stepped forward with false rape accusations to bring awareness to the issue, enough genuine hate crimes exist that no one should fake them for the sake of awareness. That only makes things more difficult for victims to have their voices be heard in the future. 
In fact, though Susan Smith and Charles Stewart were both easily believed by the police, media, and various communities, some black on white racial hoaxes have faced more scrutiny and lasting backlash than their counterparts. For example, in 1987, a 15-year-old black girl named Tawana Brawley from Wappinger Falls, New York, disappeared for four days. When she was discovered, she told police she'd been abducted and raped by six white police officers. Tawana claimed to have been smeared with feces, placed in a plastic bag, and left in a gutter. Court documents say that she was found in this state by residents of her family's former apartment complex and lay out the timeline of this case in great detail. However, there was no medical evidence to support her claims and multiple experts, whether through hair and fiber analysis for the FBI, said that her story wasn't consistent with the rape kit. Experts believed that if she had been treated so roughly and sexually assaulted, there would have been lacerations, bruising, swelling, pubic hairs, and things of that nature. FBI Special Agent Thomas Lynch, an expert in forensic evidence, testified that the plastic bag she was found in, the charred materials found beside her, and the fibers found under her fingernails were all consistent with material coming from inside her mother's apartment. This story has been very widely discredited, with some sources claiming that she made it up to avoid being beaten by her mother's boyfriend after she had run away from home. If Tawana really had been mistreated for four days, it's extremely unlikely that there wouldn't be a single shred of evidence somewhere to back up her claims. The distress Tawana caused was unjust, and she has since changed her name and refuses to speak publicly about the incident. This case had serious consequences though, not only on Tawana, but those around her. A $30 million suit was brought against her and her advisors, and a default judgment was entered against her. One of her lawyers a few years later was disbarred from practicing law altogether. The lie Tawana told was disgusting, absolutely, but you gotta remember she was also only 15 and potentially lying to avoid being beaten, to be assaulted. How come she's seen as a liar and a fraud and has to change her name, but young white men that rape women in this country like Brock Turner are given minimal sentences, if any at all, because judges don't want to ruin their futures. It's hypocrisy to the fullest extent. Now, Tawana's case isn't the only black on white racial hoax that's garnered national attention during this time period either. Just a few years later in 1990, Sabrina Collins, a student at Emory University, said she'd been left traumatized and mute after receiving racially motivated hate mail and death threats. Her room had supposedly been ransacked and slurs were written on her walls, but it wasn't true. While a handwriting analysis had cleared her, at least according to her lawyer, a fingerprint analysis didn't. Officials said her allegations coincided with an Emory Honors Code investigation of suspicions that she had cheated in a chemistry class. Not to mention the letters had a grammatical error she commonly made and were typed on the same typewriter Sabrina used where she worked. Though no evidence supported her claims, plenty of it contradicted them. AP News reported at the time that the county solicitor, Ralph Bowden, believed Sabrina needed counseling and treatment, not prosecution. I am relieved to see that this case seems to have been handled kind of properly, and I'm hoping that she gets the help she needs. And this is why cases like this need to be taken on a case by case basis too. It's different when you're accusing a specific person and potentially ruining someone's life versus making up anonymous letters as a cry for help. While it's important to look at the motives and history of racial hoaxes, I don't wanna leave you with the impression that every hoax we mentioned represents the whole, as these are only a few examples. Hopefully though, this still provides some important context as we move to one of the most infamous recent cases of a racial hoax involving Jesse Smollett. Jesse Smollett, a black gay actor who had been working on the show Empire at the time, told police on January 29th, 2019, that he had been attacked by two masked men in downtown Chicago. He claimed that they made homophobic and racist slurs and even put a rope around his neck and poured some sort of chemical on him, later said to be bleach. That same day, the Chicago Sun-Times reported the story and spokesperson for the police, Guglielmi, said that Smollett had been hesitant to call the police because of his status as a public figure. When officers did arrive, he still had a thin light rope around his neck and lacerations on his face. The attackers also supposedly mentioned MAGA country, a reference to the Trump Make America Great Again slogan, but at the time there was nothing more to go on and no video surveillance had been released. Just a day later on January 30th, investigators announced they had found footage of two potential persons of interest and by February 3rd, Smollett was performing again. Even those that didn't watch Empire or listen to his music bought tickets to his show as a sign of solidarity. One attendee, Royce Johnson, told the New York Times, "'As a gay man, there is a proclivity to be victimized in many ways, and it's part of our active narrative. But watching what he did tonight, it left me feeling empowered.'" 
On February 13th, two men were questioned in regards to the Smollett case, the Osandario brothers. One of them had appeared as an extra in Empire before, so while the case was still new, things at least seemed to support Smollett's version of events. A few news reports began to suspect this was a hoax, despite Chicago police disputing this. Smollett is an actor after all, and put on an incredible performance during an interview on February 14th, explaining what happened and how he could never imagine faking such a thing. And in my opinion, he did a really, really, really good job of faking it, by the way. He was crying, saying he wants people to be found, but it has always struck me at how odd he claims he didn't notice the noose until he looked down and saw it around his neck. That's one point of contention that I and many have had with the story, and I could understand why it it would be. It's it's always been this strange, I don't know what to call it. it. It's kind of weird. How could you not notice that? But it's not only how could you not notice that, but you left it on or you claimed you put it back on when police arrived. I don't know. That part of it was always just really strange to me. Like I know if I was assaulted with some kind of object, I would not want that object anywhere near me. I would not want to put it back on me or have it near me when police arrived. I would be like, that is the thing and point to it and be like, I'm not touching that anymore. So it just, I don't know, it, opinion. It's just, it was weird to me. Then two days later, the police announced that Smollett was wanted for questioning after the two men claimed that he hired them to commit this hate crime. Smollett's lawyers released a statement a little while later that read the following. Like any other citizen, Mr. Smollett enjoys the presumption of innocence, particularly when there has been an investigation like this one where information, both true and false, has been reportedly leaked. Given these circumstances, we intend to conduct a thorough investigation and to mount on an aggressive defense. So things were not looking good for Smollett. Police said that he had hired the brothers to attack him so that he could gain publicity and potentially negotiate a higher salary on Empire. People had purchased concert tickets in solidarity when they believed he was the victim of a hate crime. So it didn't sound like a stretch to believe that it might work. Once the brothers spoke out though, that plan fell apart and Smollett was arrested and lost his job on Empire entirely. However, racial hoax or not, Smollett is a celebrity and money and fame are notorious for sweeping things under the rug. In this case, the prosecution, Miss Fox, dropped the charges of disorderly conduct against Smollett for community service and his agreement to forfeit a $10,000 bond to the city of Chicago. Some called this an appropriate resolution while others referred to it as a whitewashing of justice. Many in Chicago felt duped or used, enough so that the city of Chicago itself took action and filed a suit of their own. In April, 2019, the city announced that they were seeking over $130,000 to cover the cost of the police investigation that had been conducted due to his false report. City officials claimed that two dozen officers worked 1,836 hours on the case, amounting to $130,106.15. Multiple news organizations, including the New York Times, asked for court documents to be made publicly accessible while all this was happening, and thankfully in May, they were. Public case files reveal that soon after Smollett was charged, prosecutors were thinking about resolving the case, revealing that consequences for Smollett seemingly were not their priority. Though Smollett and his team tried to keep the documents sealed for privacy sake, the records and the case in its entirety became very public and intensely scrutinized. Not only was the city of Chicago suing him, but Judge Michael Tooman ordered that a special prosecutor independently investigate why the charges against Smollett had been dropped in the first place. That prosecutor, Daniel K. Webb, said that Ms. Fox's office hadn't produced any evidence that the case against Smollett was weak. She had no reason to drop it or to believe that there was insufficient evidence, so why not charge him? Well, some critics say that Fox shouldn't have even handled Smollett's case once it became clear that Smollett was the perpetrator, as she had earlier contact with Smollett's representatives when he was still considered a victim. Therefore, Fox already had close contact with the case, but from an entirely different light. Some have argued it was inappropriate of her to hand this case to her deputy instead of formally recusing herself. Although Webb stated in August, 2020, that though the office didn't violate the law, they did abuse their discretion in deciding to drop charges and put out false or misleading public statements as to why it did so. More specifically, Webb claimed that Fox's office breached its obligations of honesty and transparency by making false statements, such as its claim that Mr. Smollett was just one of thousands of defendants whose case had been referred for for alternative prosecution. In fact, multiple lawyers were shocked that the office dropped charges against him so quickly and that Smollett wasn't even required to plead guilty. Truth be told, there was enough evidence to bring Smollett to justice and try him for disorderly conduct. And in February, 2020, that's exactly what was done. And a grand jury indicted him on six counts of disorderly conduct. In November, 2021, the trial finally began. Though Smollett continued to deny faking the attack for the jury, it simply did not add up. 
One of them stated that as an African-American, they would have never placed the noose used in the hate crime around their neck. Smollett alleged that though he had taken it off, he put it back on when police arrived to show them what had happened. And again, my opinion, stepping in here really quick again, but my opinion here is that you could just show the police what happened. You didn't have to keep touching it, not only for like the sake of fingerprints, but for the fact that a noose is kind of symbolic in a really negative way. And the only like relatable way in terms of like how I can like see it if the lens was shifted, like, I don't know, like if, if a hate crime occurred against me or something would be like, because I'm Polish, right? So my family has family that died in concentration camps. And that would be like the equivalent of someone running up to me, putting like a Nazi flag around me or something, or I don't know, some kind of symbolic Nazi imagery. And then of course I would go home, call the police or whatever, throw that shit off. But then the police arrive and then I put it back on. It just doesn't make sense to me. Not once did the jury disagree on the verdict, though they spent nine and a half hours deliberating and reviewing the details of the case. Afterwards, Smollett was found guilty on five of the six counts of lying to the police that were brought against him. His team intended to file for an appeal, and as of writing that, sentencing has not yet taken place. Mr. Webb has said that for each count of disorderly conduct, it could result in three years maximum in prison, but cases like this rarely lead to incarceration. But he has said, there's never been a case like this. I don't know any case in Illinois that involves this criminal misconduct and deceiving police for weeks on end about a hate crime and then compounding it by lying to a jury. What I could see happening is probation with a ton of community service hours, said Michael O'Meara, a criminal defense lawyer who has also worked as a prosecutor. And just to sting him a bit, maybe some jail time. Catherine Russell Brown, whose book, The Color of Crime was invaluable to my research, has also spoken about this particular case, stating that it's the only case that involved a celebrity hoax perpetrator that she's aware of. And Smollett's allegations of homophobic and racist slurs impacted multiple marginalized communities at once. Yet there are some familiar rings to it. Many hoaxes will have dramatic criminal flourishes, everything from strange body odors to gang rapes. Strangely specific details like this is MAGA country are common, while facts of the case might be muddled. Most recently, Jesse has even claimed that he had a sexual relationship with the two men and that they had done drugs at a bathhouse and quote, made out and masturbated together in the past. That's the quote. A hate letter that Jesse received just a week before the attack containing slurs and drawings of him hanging from a tree has also come into question. Jesse seems to be trying to sell this as a lover's gone wrong case, but generally speaking, the public doesn't seem to believe him. We're still awaiting further updates on the case, the lawsuit from the city of Chicago itself, and what consequences Smollett may face. But in the meantime, let's see the fallout and general debate this has caused. Shortly after it became clear that Smollett was lying, an article was released in the Wall Street Journal entitled, Hate Crime Hoaxes Are More Common Than You Think by political scientist, Jason Riley. Out of the 346 allegations he studied, supposedly less than a third of them were genuine. Some of them were relatively minor, like a gay pastor claiming that a Whole Foods sewed him a cake with a slur on it, while others were extreme, like a woman in Oregon that disfigured her face with acid and claimed a black man had done it. Riley's concern is understandably the politicization of hate crimes. As we saw with Smollett, his supposed attackers shouted a political slogan after all. In the mainstream media, we hear almost constant talk about scary new forms of racism, white privilege, cultural appropriation, and subtle bigotry, Mr. Riley writes. Yet a huge percentage of the horrific hate crimes cited as evidence of contemporary bigotry are fakes. His book, Hate Crimes Hoax, is similar to Catherine's in the sense that it too examines racial hoaxes. However, whereas Riley seems concerned about people lying to victimize themselves, Catherine pointed out how many racial hoaxes have been about stereotyping and demonizing black people. I wanted to learn a bit more about Riley's statistics and if his claims about hate crimes were actually accurate. So I did a bit more digging. The ADL or Anti-Defamation League has written an article in direct response to Riley's that makes for quite a few important points the Wall Street Journal just didn't address. For instance, even if less than a third of hate crimes were true, between 2010 and 2017, the FBI reported almost 50,000 hate crimes. So the implication that racism shouldn't be discussed frequently or that it's not a massive problem is not based in reality. Plus, if Riley analyzed about 400 cases, that's less than 1% of overall cases during that time period. And he neglects to mention a 17% jump in hate crimes between the years 2016 to 2017. 
And again, oh Lord, is my opinion just scattered throughout here, but that's why I'm kind of like, wow, wow, um, opinion moment. Um, 2016 to 2017, that's a very interesting set of years for an increase of crime to start occurring just saying. And by the way, 2017 is where the study stopped when I looked at it. So it's not that suddenly it goes down or whatever in 2018 onward. It's just, that's where it stopped. Anyway, CNN reported just a couple months ago that hate crime reports have surged to their highest level in 12 years overall. Today's episode may be on racial hoaxes and the damage they cause, but for anyone to look at a racial hoax and treat it as an indicator that hate crimes don't exist is blatantly false. It's virtually impossible to measure the scale of racism. Whether it's slurs, attacks, or a hoax, racism is unfortunately very alive and well. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. I know this is not the most cheerful subject, but I think it's an important one that needs to be discussed. If you learned something new from today's episode, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all recent episodes as they come out. If you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to go to my Linktree link. It'll get you links to all of my social media, including my Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, other YouTube channels, other projects I'm involved in, Candle Shop, limited edition plushie, you name it, it's all gonna be there. So thank you so much for making it to today's episode. I know, again, not an easy one, but thank you for being here. I know it's Christmas Eve. For those of you that celebrate, happy holidays and all that jazz. And for everyone else, it's Friday. So yeah, thank you all so much for making it. I hope you learned something from today's episode. I am still learning from today's episode. There's so much more that could still be dug up and talked about just based on the initial research for this episode. So anyway, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.